Yeah. <laughs> Happy Hump Day, everybody. Welcome to uh, another t episode of TJ's Corner, this Wacky Wednesday with my Wacky Flamingo shirt and one of my wacky, amazing, crazy, unbelievable friends. I am so honored to have this woman here today. Um, I have to read because um, I was starting to write down, you know, notes about like all the things she's done. And I was like, holy moly, like, you know, your friends have done a lot, but good Lord. So just... Bear with me here. Um, she's been in more Broadway shows and, and things of the like than I can count, uh, truly. But just to name a few, uh, this incredible uh, woman was in the original cast of City of Angels, Scarlet from Brunel, Victor Victoria, putting it together, Jessica Rose, and most recently, of course, Disaster, the musical, and Head Over Heels, as well as other Broadway shows, West End and Tours, Les Mis, Kiss Me Kate, of course, of which her performance was filmed and aired. Uh, and then we have Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Jonathan Price, Anything Goes, 101 Dalmatians, Camelot, Great Gardens at the Amundsen. It goes on and on, people. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Please welcome my dear friend, uh, Miss Rachel York. Woo! Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, and then of course, her crowning achievement playing Morticia Adams in 3D Theatrical's production of The Adams Family. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry to interrupt you, TJ, but take a look at Robert Yako's background. It's great. <laughs> oh, yes, Robert Yako. Where is he? Hold on. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Rachel, have you seen Robert's background? It's you and, and uh, it's you and Adams Family. Because you know, Robert from Adam's family. Oh, can I, do, oh I, have, I don't know, I have to figure oh, out. Oh, go to gallery it. view, gallery view, top right hand oh, corner. Got it, oh, look at here. Um, ah, I love it, I love it. <laughs> I have glasses to see, is that crazy? <laughs> I'm no spring chicken, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be so much fun, you guys, today. Um, truly, like, so much to talk about and so many fun so stories and, all kinds of things. So uh, let's dive in, Rachel. So um, before we get going, um, Rachel is a very, very funny woman. She does uh, funny, and she does it all very, very well, but she is often a very, very funny woman uh, in what she does. And she um, also will do her one woman show uh, on, um, you do a celebrity cruise lines, right? Or crystal cruises, I forget. Crystal, what, what, crystal cruises. Crystal. Um, and um, she does insane impressions. There's a, uh, and if you ever look it up on YouTube, uh, there's her singing, I will always love you. And it goes from herself. And then it's like Dolly Parton, Judy Garland, Cher, Nora Jones, Julie Andrews, Christina Aguilera, Celine Dion, Eartha Kitt, ending as Whitney Houston. So <laughs> it is quite the journey of women that she does. Um, who's your favorite person to impersonate, Rachel? And where did that all come how did that all come to be for you? Like, um, see, uh, you know, finding out that you had an ear um, for other people's voices as well. You know, it was when I it was when I was a kid. Um, I was I, I was a latchkey kid. I was I was alone in the house a lot, <laughs> and I had a lot of time to fill. And I would do impressions. Well, part of it was I would study different voices and that was sort of my escape from being alone all the time. Yeah. So I would listen to different artists or musicals and try to imitate where they place their voice and, and practice for hours. I would practice for hours. And then it just sort of happened. I would just sing like somebody or I'd try to sing, but, but I didn't really think of myself as an impressionist or anything like that. Sure, sure. Um, it was just something I did. And in fact, uh, when I was young, I used to do an impression of um, you know, 100, 101 Dalmatians. Oh. I would go, where are those, I want those puppies, you know, and I, I, that, was, that was from a kid. I did that as a kid uh. as a joke to my family. Um, and so then later on when I played the role, I kind of, you know, remembered that and-, and, and Can we just it. real quickly talk about 101 Dalmatians? Cause there's a clip of you on YouTube just slaying this song. It was so funny because I had no idea at the time that you were doing the, the tour. It was supposed to come to LA before it got canceled. And then I didn't end up getting to see it. But I saw this clip of you and fully, full disclosure, like 
just kind of arms crossed, like, what the hell is this going to be? And you kill. It is so funny. I was like, oh, my gosh. Because, you know, um, of course, the original cartoon is amazing. And then uh, later on, you know, they had the live action films where, um, oh, my gosh, why am I blanking on her name? Uh, um, Sunset Boulevard. Oh, Colden. <laughs> no, Colden. Oh. Glenn Close. Glenn Close. Yeah, Glenn Close. Oh my God. Wow. We are, we're birthday buddies. How can I? Yeah, you get the point. We're birthday buddies and I freaking love her. How can I forget her name? But Glenn Close is like amazing. And then along comes Rachel York just slaying, I think the most evil villain because you can make backstories like Maleficent where, you know, you find out why she's such a horrible person, but I'm sorry, you kill puppies. Like there's just no excuse. There's no excuse. She's the worst. I had so much fun. You clearly did. You were amazing so, in it. It was so much fun. It was such a, it, you know, that was a whole, that's a whole learning experience there. But um, unfortunately, the creative team didn't get along too well. And not everybody was really focused on this project. And, and the cast was just glorious. It was just wonderful. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 they just kept cutting and cutting and, and they were cutting the heart out of it. And then they couldn't decide whether it was a Broadway show or a kid's show. And, right. But the, the thing is, I, I wish it had gone further. I would have loved, maybe someday I'll just have to write like a, a, a Cruella de Vil monologue and make Heck it short. Yes, because do she, it. It's so much fun playing that character. She's so delicious and you made it so much more delicious. And it was just, that one, this clip of you on YouTube, look it up, guys. It is so worth it. it it's a killer song that I, it would be a great audition song for people, too. I don't know if that... Well, I, I, you know. there's that one, I always get my way. It's like a real belt. Yeah, big belt. You're in like a, a nightclub or some kind of restaurant or something. And, uh, and then the, the hotter, the better, you know. It's yes, like, it's so good. And it's like it's like her Hello, Dolly moment. It's, that, it's so good. It's just brilliant. Um, and yeah, it's, it was such an interesting concept with like the stilts or high shoes or whatever, but yeah, it was, you were brilliant in it. So, oh, um, anyway, it was just, on, onward and upward, onward and upward, you know, yes, but of course. Um, so how old were you when you, you, so you started to sing then obviously at a very young age, I asked you about impressions, but you kind of went into the singing. You, did you start? Just singing randomly as a kid, and you heard, you know, someone heard you had a natural, but did you start training early on? Like, how did that all happen? I have to go back to my mom. Um, my mom used to sing at the piano, and I would dance around the living room, and I'd say, Daddy, oh, no. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> no, but I really would. And my daughter does the same thing. Um, that's what kids do. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I totally lost my train of thought. But yes, my mom used to sing. And I, the first time I heard Ella Fitzgerald, she had a record of Ella Fitzgerald. And I thought, Mom, is that you singing? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's how I listened to my mom. And my mom wanted to be, uh, I feel like in another life, she wanted to be an actress and a singer. And she got married when she was 19. There's a lot of stories like that, I think, for, of course. for our moms. Yeah. And, uh, you give so, up a lot when you become a parent, for sure. You know, Or some do. Some give it up. Some give all of it up. But yeah, that's that definitely, I think, especially of that generation. So that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, I just, I would sing and eventually I was in school, I was in choir. And at some point I kind of woke up and I was like, Hey, I, I got Broadway something. sounds good. <laughs> I got something here that, you know, like I can, I, I really have an ear here. I just started note and I started getting the solos in school. Um, and I, I was kind of shy. We had moved uh, to a new state, to Colorado, when I was nine. And I think that that, my vo that was where I could find bring out my confidence, because I was a little shy and everything. Um, and yeah, I, I, then eventually I decided I wanted to be an actor. And I just- When did it become like, head. when did, what is it like, Broadway or bust? When did that happen for you? <laughs> Um, I wanted to be film actress. 
I, uh, I, and I, so my senior year of high school, uh, we were, in, I was, my school in Colorado was not, they had a good uh, theatrical department and uh, choir department, thank God, because it was my escape. I really didn't, I didn't enjoy school. That mm -hmm. was, that was the only way I could, I could live <laughs> was, was by being a thespian. And, but the school didn't really appreciate the arts. And I was really upset about that. And we moved to California when I was a senior and they were really into the theater yeah. department. And they had a show called Evita they were doing that year. And I won the part of Evita and I got the Macy Award. We all know what that is out there. I have a Macy Award. Macy Gretchen has a Macy Award. <laughs> right here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, I, after I graduated, I wanted to go to Juilliard and that didn't happen. Um, They're lost. Yeah, and I, my parents were having financial difficulty. It was just, it was like a bad time to have to go to school. To school and I enough. decided that I, I, I remember trying to get an agent in Los Angeles when right, like right after school. I had a scholarship to the American Center for Music Theater, which they had at the Dorothy, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. So I did that for two years and then, um, my acting coach, I was taken with Aaron Spicer in, in Los Angeles, who's now I think a big uh, acting coach. Um, and I was one of his first. And he, uh, he encouraged me to, to move to New York because he knew I could sing. And I, one of the things I felt I was lacking was just life experience. Uh, I, uh, and so many plays that we read when we're in acting school, they take place in New York. And that was just such a, foreign entity yeah. and so I decided to move out with my friend uh, April Beyer and um, we uh, yeah we moved to the West Village and we went to Herbert Berghoff Studios HB Studios and it was, it was tough it was it was a it, it was a wake-up call you know because we I was 19 she was 18 and we were just figuring out how to be adults sure. much less live in New York by ourselves and try yeah. to, uh, you know, combat the, um, the business of, of acting, you know, hundred oh, percent. I, I literally, people are like, should I move to New York? And I'm like, just prepare your spirit because it is not for the faint of heart, like ever. Um, so how about for, for you, um, you get there, then, Life oh, and then, and then our, our friendship totally collapsed. Oh, no. So we didn't talk to each other for 20 years, and now we're best friends again. Oh, I love that. But, but we didn't talk to each other forever. We, you know, we went our separate ways, and I thought I was going to become a homeless person. And I have, a, <laughs> I, have a, I have these stories. I have a story that actually Seth Rudetsky loves me to tell, which was at one point, I, I did get this, I got the studio apartment on 92nd Street, and I was on the first floor. and. You know how uh, those old apartments, they have the air conditioning in the wall yeah, yeah. and you take it out. It's like, there's nothing there. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so there was like a piece of cardboard. Like when I slept at night, it was a studio between me and the street. And I would hear homeless people going through the trash, like literally like feet away from where I slept. And so, it, I got really, I got really depressed and discouraged. Um, you know, I, all I saw was homeless people and how hard it was and I wasn't getting good feedback. And of course, I mean, if that's how you feel when you're trying to, you know, spread joy in this world and, and uh, be an actor, uh, it's not going to, you're not going to do very well. You're not going to do that. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. At one point I got really, I got really bottom of the barrel and my mom came out and she was sort of surprised she's like oh I didn't realize it was so bad <laughs> and uh she got me on a practice on meditating every day doing yoga every day and uh, you know I would I would read positive thinking books um and I sort of submerged my subconscious with positive thinking opposed to the negative thoughts that were plaguing me every moment of the day and Within weeks, I started getting positive feedback, and I mean, it's quite, it's it's logical. It's it's, you know, luckily people talk about this now. At the time, my mom and 
you know, it was like the new age people talked about it. But yeah. now I think actors are really using this. And it's, oh, yeah. it's like what we're helpful. doing, like with 3DU, we literally start every day with three classes that have something to do with movement or body, mind, soul type stuff. So it is so important, I think, um, in just centering yourself and knowing yourself better and all that. So I think it's very valuable advice on your part. So from you, so you have that experience and then from getting to New York to the incredible first Broadway debut in City of Angels, how, how long did that, how long was that? So, now I really, I mean, I was visualizing night and day because I had nothing to lose. I had yeah. nothing to lose. There's right. some kind of freedom in that. Yeah. And there's some kind of freedom like right now about that because I, yeah. there's almost, I feel like I'm full circle here. Yeah. Um, because when you have nothing to lose, it's like, why not? Why not believe? Always the jobs you book, right? When you go in and you're like, ah, whatever, I don't got nothing to lose. <laughs> yes. Right? So yeah. I started visualizing uh, every day and I didn't even, it wasn't even that specific. I, part of it was, I wasn't forcing the vision. It sort of came and then I just kept singing, seeing it. And the vision was, I was this, I, I saw myself in this light blonde wig and I was playing this kind of sexy character. I didn't know anything about it. And I was on stage and it was like a supporting role. And that was sort of the vision that I kept seeing. It was just like this blonde just kind of sexy character on stage. That's, that's all I got. It was kind of vague, but it was there. And I kept seeing that. And eventually, um, a lot of things started happening. I got a job in Monaco. I was uh, singing at the Casino de Paris, wow. uh, which was really an amazing experience. Uh, it was such a, that was almost like a reward for all of the positive thinking I'd been doing. I was in paradise. I was in literal paradise. Yeah. Um, and, and then later on, I went back and I sang with a French band. They, this crazy, crazy producer, literally crazy, um, uh, wanted to hire a French singer and a and an American singer to do this this rock band. Do this he wanted to develop this new rock band. So I sang with all of these French uh, rock musicians. They were wonderful. I spoke not great French, but enough to have conversations. And we were like sleeping out in this um, this kind of shut down restaurant of some kind <laughs> and sleeping bags and we were rehearsing during, during the day. Anyway, I ended up leaving the project because the guy was, literally was crazy. And, um, and it, there was something about finding my dignity in that moment because it was like, no, I'm not, I'm not putting myself through this. Right. And I, I remember like sort of praying to the stars, like, is this what I want? Do I want to be like this recording artist, this Euro <laughs> recording artist? I just don't know. And I, anyway, that, I, then I got back, I went back to New York and um, then I was recording some other stuff. Then this other guy hired me to record his stuff and he didn't really know what he was doing. Eventually, I got an audition for Phantom of the Opera. I went in there, I used to be a first soprano. I, used, I, had, I was like way up there and I sang really well. But then they handed me the sides and I didn't prepare, I hadn't, I, I didn't get any, they didn't give me any sides at all before the audition. Right. And I didn't expect to be reading at the audition. I thought right. I was just going in to sing. Right. And I didn't have the wherewithal at the time, because I was 20, right. to say, you know what? I don't feel comfortable. I didn't, I don't, I, I you know, I haven't seen the show. I, I don't know what's happening in this scene. Uh, I just need some time to really study it for myself. That's what I should have done. But instead, I was like, oh, I had a panic attack, a, oh. I had a wild panic attack. And I was like, <gasps> so I got up there, I was trying to read, I was like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So I, bombed. I bombed, I really bombed the audition and they said they were gonna hire me on my voice. And it made me so mad. And then a week later, I get this audition for this new musical called City of Angels and they want a Marilyn Monroe type. I knew a little bit about Marilyn Monroe. I, I loved old movies, but I'm like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this. <laughs> so 
I, I, you know, rented every Marilyn movie I could find, and I was, you know, studying her mannerisms, doing everything I could. They wanted scat song, they wanted a jazz song. I, I gave them an Ella, and that was up my alley because I listened to Ella Fitzgerald when I was young, and I loved to scat and everything. So I'm like, this is like for me, <laughs> and I've been in there so prepared. I am telling you, I knew that stuff backwards and forwards. I went in there. And I did a whole Marilyn Monroe thing, and hey, and what do you know? I got the part, you oh, know. So um, it's so perfect. <laughs> and so I, I walked out of the audition, and this is really special because you know what? This audition, there was Cy Coleman and and David Zippel, who was a new guy on the block, and um, Larry Gelbart, who wrote Mash. I mean, his yeah. His work is is, is he, he's done so much in his in his uh, in his career. He did so much, and I got into the elevator, and Larry Gelbart got into the elevator with me, and I was like, "Hi," you know, and he said, "How old are you?" And I said, "I'm 20." And he said, "You're going to be a big star." So Larry Gelbart said that to me. Can you That's believe amazing. it? That's amazing. And I get downstairs and we didn't have cell phones at the time. So I went to a pay phone and I called my agent. I said, I think I got the part. Oh. Um, so that was just so exciting for me. I, and, and, and I had created this, you know, I, there's an empowering feeling. It's like, I created this. It's, it's exactly what I've visualized. That said, I was also so green. <laughs> I was so green and, um, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and and the show is very it has a, there's a cynicism to the show and you know i'm working with these veteran actors so that was an yeah, what a what a cast what a group of people to be you know your initial yeah. like mentors in that in that process that's amazing it was it was such a gift it was i was felt so blessed and i thought the show was the best thing in the world and and actually um, sort of the energy backstage before we were opening was that, you know, maybe we're probably not going to get good reviews. They're probably not going to get it. That kind of a thing. There was, there was a little bit of fear backstage. I remember. And I was like, why? It's going to be great. Yeah. I'm visualizing. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the headlines. <laughs> so I take full credit for its success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah no so we ended up being a big success we got these great reviews and um it's I, I anybody who doesn't know city of angels i i suggest you you listen to the soundtrack it is just some it's of the amazing, most amazing and there's, music. there's even um you can look there's some of your b-roll is on youtube where you can actually see like uh some nice clips of the show professionally shot and it's beautiful i have to ask you some questions about the show um so developing like what was it like developing that show working with Cy Coleman I mean that all of that like what was it like developing it um it has a uh insane concept and set design for those that aren't familiar with it there's a, a the the real world and then the the world in which he's writing which is like a um all black and white so the set design is like half color and half black and white Rachel was in the uh film noir <laughs> Everybody was in both. Is it, oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And um, yeah, that's right. Because everyone was a representation of someone in, in his life or whatever. But anyway, the um, and also, were you really naked in that bed? You looked naked in that bed. <laughs> uh, well, I had a, I had a G string on. Okay, so not fully it, naked I, in that bed. You understand? I was very modest young girl. I was. I, I have never been like an exhibitionist. I, just so you know. I, right. And I. No way to no way to jump into that be baptized by fire than to be naked in a property. Those show. people who who can you know who can do that, but I you know I I luckily they take they took care of me. Um, they had everybody leave the room so I could work, but I wore a G string and then I put my mic pack right between, right in my chest here, and so it kind of felt and I had to tape it, which was kind of painful, um, with skin tape. But it, it, I felt like I was wearing a, ba a really skimpy bathing suit, so that well, that's good. Mind, that made it okay. Yeah, I mean, it was such a 
uh, sexy scene and and so well executed. But um, you guys did a, two more questions on that show before we move because there's times a ticking and so much to talk about. Um, but you know, you guys had a reunion recently uh, via Zoom, as so many um, things, TV shows and and Broadway shows and whatnot are doing right now, which is such a gift. How was that reuniting with everybody? What did you do? Is it available for us to see somewhere? And yeah. then. Star also, why haven't we had a revival of that show yet? Why do you think it hasn't been revived? Well, David Zippel, who is on, you'll see on Stars in the House, it's on Stars in the House. You just have to go to, I think you could just find it on Google. And um, there's several different episodes, but ours is the uh, City of Angels reunion. Uh, David Zippel is, he, they just did a production of it at the Chocolate Factory in London. And he's been trying to do a revival. And I would love to play Bobby. I was gonna say, like, you should absolutely move into that part. It'd be great. I don't know. I don't know why. Every I can't tell you how many times I hear that question. Why hasn't it been revived? Why hasn't it been revived? So I mean, there's shows that have been literally, the, like, they'll revive a show from ten years ago, and yet they haven't revived that show. It's so strange. Yeah. Uh, reviving they, Legally Blonde, like they're reviving Legally Blonde, but they have not revived City of Angels. What? <laughs> So strange. Well, I thought Michael Blakemore, who um, directed it, was was ingenious. Um, but to take what he did, and then, you know, maybe even just make it better, that somebody has an opportunity to do that. So, yeah, um, hopefully someday. Uh, yeah. So really quickly, on uh, it was such a professional atmosphere when I first entered the room. Uh, we all sat around, you know, in this in the a big studio. Uh, around a big table and read through the script. And I heard my song for the first time, uh, Lost and Found. And I just, it was, it was so exciting. I just can't, it was one of the most exciting times in my life to be in this room. You can imagine, here I am, you know, I've never been on Broadway before. I'm working with, uh, with Cy Coleman. Yeah, and, come on. Yeah. And all of these great Broadway uh, veterans. Um, it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah, D. Hody. I mean, like D. Hody is amazing. Um, so okay, moving into what had to be a light. I I don't get. I have a respect for people's careers, of course, but I don't really get like starstruck. But like, if I were to meet Julie Andrews, I'd probably fall apart. So you not only have met her. I've seen when I look at your Instagram and you're at having tea with your daughter at Julie Andrews house, I literally like want to throw my phone across the room. Cause I'm like, what must that be like? But, um, your, um, you've been in two Broadway shows with that woman <laughs> and not like in some part that didn't interact with her, but like intimately, um, in a tiny cast putting it together. And then of course, in, uh, bringing her film, you know, to Broadway, Victor Victoria, and then playing, you know, the other female lead. So, Tell me about Miss oh, Dame Julie Andrews. Tell me about Dame Julie Andrews. That. Well, and you've heard this before, but she's exactly the way you would think she would be. Yeah. Uh, the first time I met, I like to tell this story. The first time I met her, I went to her office in Brentwood, and uh, she opens the door and she says, "Hello, so now let me give you a big hug. Oh, can I make you a cup of tea?" And uh, I thought that her assistant, her assistant was also there and I thought she was gonna go make the cup of tea, but Julie went and made me the cup of tea herself. Oh. So she's a wonderful combination of like, she's grounded, she's this big movie star, you know, that's, that everybody just idolizes and puts on a pedestal. She's like royalty. And then there's also, there's a groundedness to her and a very, a very human, a humanness to her. Um, She's uh, and so gracious and graceful um, and goofy. She's complex, you know, in that way. She has lots of, lots of colors and, and just a, a wonderful, wonderful person. My friend, um, so our mutual friend of ours, John Tartaglia, um, worked with her on, um, on Julie's Green Room, which I'm so bummed didn't get greenlit for, uh, you know, future seasons because my kids were in love with it. It was just, That's as awesome. we're we it was so good but anyway he's like you never like he said all the things you just said and then like the way that because she's also like you know been in the business long enough to know what she wants and know exactly how she wants it and 
Um, and the way that she would deliver news like that was so incredibly British and just very like, huh. And then she would just like walk, walk away and everyone's like, well, she didn't like that. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> but it was just so, like, she's so eloquent and, and gracious and lovely and every, every story that I've ever heard about her. So it's nice when you hear that celebrities like that live up to what you hope they are, which is amazing. So that had to be a life-changing moment for you doing putting it together. Um, and, um, and then later getting to reunite with her in um, Victor Victoria. So let's talk about Victor Victoria um, for a minute, because I know we're gonna get through like some stories and then I wanna talk to you about actually a few of these roles that you've created and, and your process in doing that. But um, so you were doing, you know, uh, Victor Victoria, her, her last Broadway show that she, yeah. in, she didn't know that was gonna be her last Broadway show, but went out, uh, she went out of the show. You didn't know, she might do another one. <laughs> That's true, yeah, <laughs> amen, and I hope so. Um, but so her, um, she went out of the show and then in comes another legend, Liza Minnelli. Like what, you get to then play opposite Liza Minnelli. <laughs> Please tell me about that. Well, if you don't mind, if you don't mind terribly, you do, to I would love to tell you about my time with Julie a little bit, and then the which Please will make do. much, much clearer. Yes, anyway, uh, <laughs> yes. So you know, we shared a dressing room together, which is which was really cool. Can you imagine? I mean, I not only she didn't have her own dressing room. <laughs> we shared a dressing room together and putting it together amazing and she was like my mom she was like my second mom and you know she's always oh rachel you need to take better care of yourself you know <laughs> that kind of thing and i was uh, she called Have me a brother's pastille darling yeah <laughs> she, she called me she said oh rachel you're so cheeky you're so <laughs> cheeky uh because i would tease her i that was just our relationship you know but she got it you know because she has that she's actually pretty she's game She's yeah. a good chick, if you know what I mean. She's not always royalty. You are, and, everyone's saying in the chat right now, which I have to interject, your impression of Julie is <laughs> insane. Like, on point. If she ever needed a sound alike for anything, book that, book yes, it. Yes, and I have, and I was like, I wish more people would hire me for sound alikes. Yeah. If you need any birthday, uh, you know, <laughs> somebody wants their birthday song is Julie Andrews. Um, <laughs> So anyway, so uh, I tell this story, if you don't mind, I'm, I'll tell this little story that I tell, which is, um, you know, sometimes we were doing a tough eight shows a week, right? And sometimes at the end of the week, she would come into our dressing room and she'd say, oh, oh, Rachel, I'm exhausted. I don't think I have it in me. And I would say to her, Julie, am I going to have to sing you the song? And she'd say, oh, no, Rachel, please don't. Oh, it's a jolly holiday with Julie. <laughs> Julie makes your heart so light. Oh, f*** it, all right, I'll do the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's brilliant. So oh, f*** it, all we right. We had our own little show going on backstage. <laughs> And, and so um, she was always beloved. People just, it's so wonderful. It's, it's so amazing to see how people talk to her with such respect, no matter who they are. Yeah. Matter, whether it's the child or the president of the United States or, you know what I mean? Everybody just has such immense respect for this woman. And so it's so interesting to just watch how everybody puts on their best behavior. Oh, you know, talk to Julie, you know, not me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and honestly, it's so funny. I think I've found um, in similar circumstances with other people that are kind of like that, not, you know, people, um, I, as iconic as her, but um, when you are able to be authentically yourself and that you're not trying to be something else for them, I think they find so much like, they're so thankful for that, that you can just be real with them because they get so much unreal smoke blowing up their butt all the time, you know what I mean? So I think I'm sure she cherished that about, you know, cherishes that about you, that you're able to be who you are with her 
and that because she's Julie Andrews, it doesn't affect you. Do you know what I mean in any way? Well, but no, and I do. I, I also, I mean, no, I, I, I have such immense respect for her. So uh, of course. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding a little bit, but I, I, we would, we would play around. And I also became really good friends with her, her late husband, Blake Edwards. And, um, and I know this is a little kooky, but I, you know, I told you, I recently, um, I recently just finished writing a, a TV pilot yeah. myself, by myself for the first time. And I kind of, I don't know, I don't know if it's real or not, but I like to think that Blake helped me. You know, Blake Edwards, people, he wrote uh, uh, the Pink Panther series, all those Pink Panther movies and uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Days of Wine and Roses. I mean, he- Didn't he you also write Victor Victoria? And Victor Victoria, of course, yes. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, yes, and Victor Victoria. And interestingly enough, I was on a, I was writing one time and I wrote into the night, it was like three o'clock in the morning, I put on the TV and guess what was on the TV. And this was on a cruise ship, which only has a few channels. Right, Victor Victoria. It was Victoria, <laughs> yeah, Victor Victoria. I and so I thought, Blake! <laughs> You're like, what's up, man? <laughs> I never told Julie that I've been talking to her husband. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Um, so now tell me about, uh, tell, I know that there's this, um, there ha there's amazing Liza Minnelli's, Minnelli stories. Um, do you have one in particular you can share? Oh, you. Oh, you. <laughs> um, uh, well, Liza, I love Liza. Liza, oh my gosh, she's, she, what charisma. Oh my gosh. This, she has. I, the energy I can't I can't even describe it, and so when you are with her in her presence, it's so exciting, you know. She's this whirling dervish, you yeah. know, and you're just you're witnessing sort of this crazy greatness. Yeah. <laughs> zany, also zany, not crazy. I'll say zany. Zany, yeah, eccentric zany and fun greatness. and yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I, I just I I had a ball working with her. She, I think she was, um, she had just had a hip surgery and she was taking medication for that. And here she, she's having to be put into this role, Victor Victoria, which is quite demanding. It's on stage all the time, a lot of dancing, a lot of singing and everything. And she's just now out of the hospital and still recovering. And, and she wasn't able to show up for a lot of the rehearsals. So we were really kind of nervous. And um, on her opening night, it was like a rock concert. Uh, we were all we were we were a little bit nervous for her, but she brought it on. You know, she we kind of steered her around backstage and like, oh, over this way now. But <laughs> she it was awesome, and we're like, oh my god, it's only going to get better from here. Yes, but for some reason, probably medication and what have you, and and just her being Liza, um, <laughs> she had this. She had a a tough show, this matinee. And I could tell, luckily I didn't go on stage for like a half an hour into the show. And I could just tell her, she's not here. Eliza's not with us today. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's not here. And um, it was a pretty exciting show, actually. <laughs> uh, I remember hearing like one of the numbers, like a patter number where you have to like sing. So, you know, it's like, it's like playing tennis, you right. know, and if you drop the ball, it's like, ah, you know, what happens? <laughs> and, um, it, it was almost a train wreck. It sounded, it actually literally sounded like a train wreck. And I was sure that the curtain was going to come down, but they oh, continued no. on. And I finally got on stage and I'm doing the tango numb with her. And she's supposed to be throwing me around like with confidence and, right. and looks I she suddenly does her little thing and she looks at me like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I guess I'll be leading today. Oh, <laughs> and it was yeah. very funny because I'm like, Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> bringing myself around because you know she's supposed to be manhandling me. Oh. Um, but then we get to this one scene, and and God bless Tony Roberts. God bless him. He was having a hard time because you have to understand she wasn't there, and and so she was dropping line after line after line after line, and he was catching balls, catching balls, catching you know you know. So you can imagine. I think of it like a tennis match. You know what I mean? And he's. Oh. The whole, the whole show and he was exhausted and we get to this the scene before the end of the first act and um typically 
when Julie would do it, Julie would come in and she'd say, oh, Toddy, even when I was a second rate buffer, I had a maid. And he'd say all this stuff and then I would come on. But this time I'm watching Liza and uh, Liza comes and she says, oh, Toddy, even when I was a second rate hooker, I had a maid. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he wasn't having it. He was like, yes, well, even when I was a second, yes, well, even when you were a second rate hoofer, you didn't need a maid. <laughs> and she looks at him and she says, Chatty, are you angry with me? <laughs> Oh, the poor thing. And he says, I believe in happiness. <laughs> and she says, no, really, are you angry with me? And she's like, I think I hear Norma. And that's <laughs> when I came on. But uh, it was a. Uh, she was full on like trying to have a conversation with him. Like, like, let's just stop the show and find out. Like, <laughs> are you okay? Are we okay? <laughs> Bless her heart. Oh. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. You know, I, I, I tell you, you know, I've been on. I mean, I literally, I couldn't imagine being him because he dealt the most with her through the show. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. That was a matinee. There was a night show. I would be like, my ass is calling out. Like, <laughs> I he don't did. have the energy oh. Oh, he to did. do another. He oh, he did? Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. I was like, that's what I would do. I'd be like, I don't have it in me. I have to go sleep for five days. <laughs> after the show, she, um, she after the show, when the sh for some reason, she would always hug me at the end of the show um, when the curtain came down. Yeah. And uh, after the show, she drags me and she's, come with me, come with me, come with me. And she locks the door, locks me inside. And that, so this is like a really special moment. This is one of those trying to think of like a song where I've heard this, but it's just one of those, oh, oh, you know, and Yentl. There are moments you remember all your life. There are moments you wait for and dream all your life. Yeah. Well, it's one of those moments, right? And I'm in her dressing room and she's a whirling dervish. She's just like, oh my God, Rachel, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I just, I didn't even know what Tony said. And, you know, and, and, she, and I'm just, I'm, I'm witnessing Liza Minnelli is talking to me. You know? <laughs> like unraveling, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, this, I could, this could be, I could be talking to Julie, Judy Garland right now. It was, right. Just, it was just a moment in time where I was in awe. Wow. And I was, you know, she, and I was like, well, like, you know, you know, Tony, you know, likes to have his cues the same way. <laughs> I was like, you can, you can, uh, you can totally improvise with me. And I did, I had fun because sometimes she would do something different and I would just kind of go with it. But my character could also do that. My character yes. was very loose and yes. you could always just ad lib something silly. Yes, and um, probably built, built into that track if need be for her. Yeah, that's... Yeah, so I mean, I was, I was so grateful for that time with her. She, I, I was just in awe of her energy and her spirit. And I mean, her, her energy just filled a room so much oh man i cannot she imagine she is special oh yeah oh my yeah. gosh yeah so i know you have a brief we both have um brief funny stories another just funny broadway story you were also uh uh fontaine in les mis <laughs> and you have a javert story and i have a javert story so let's compare javert stories <laughs> you tell yours first okay so Oh, my job air story, uh, a friend of mine, uh, she had her first de Broadway or debut was Eponine and she was 18 years old. I think maybe 17 years old. Um, she had never been a member of Doctors' Equity. Um, and so she was among the time, the very historic time where like every company of Les Mis was like, all had a bunch of problems with it. And they went through and they like pretty much let everybody go and like rehired everyone in the show and so she was among she was among those that get, that got fired because she um her her write-ups and points because she was just she didn't understand she didn't read the handbook she didn't know that there was rules like you had to be there by half hour <laughs> she's like i don't come on right away so she wouldn't come like she would it's also like so adhd she would like see a circus on the side of the road and pull over and ride an elephant and then go to half hour literally that happened so um she told me though that one day she was they were in um in in the show and the javert was a alcoholic and so bad so that he 
just was always, always drunk. And, but then he had been able to kind of like do his show. And, but this one day, the revolve comes around and here he comes and he just looks out and he just goes, stars. That was it. That was all that came out of his mouth. And then he just kept looking around saying, stars. <laughs> And the, sta the stage manager's like, turn the room off, turn the room off. And then he just rotates away, just going, stars. And um, he was, of course, immediately fired. Um, and um, it was, uh, it was a, a pretty epic moment. In, oh, in it was it's like, if you think of all the bloopers that were in Les Mis, that, that would have been a really, you could make a whole movie of it. Oh, yes. <laughs> all recorded. Um, yeah, no, so I did it. I, I, I did it with these wonderful guys, uh, uh, Richard Kinsey and, uh, uh, and, um, and my friend Mark. Um, but Richard was a surfer dude at heart. And, um, and we all kind of accepted it about, but he, he would go up and it was not every show, but it was, it was like it happened every so often. And when it, and when it did, we always knew it'd be really creative. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, I know that people have heard this story, but I'm telling you, this was Richard Kinsey. This I mean, isn't hello. somebody else. So you've heard of this story, this story where Javert comes over, over the um, barricade and says, listen, my friends, I have been to their homes. I have fed all their pets. I have watered their plants. I will tell what I can. You know this one? You heard this one? Yes, I have. Because I know and Richard. He also, <laughs> also said, I passed a stone and then I trembled. <laughs> I just, uh, anyway, um, Donna Parsons, who's in here, has stage managed Richard before, and I've worked with Richard. He is so funny, but I've, I, those stories kill me. Um, so, okay. Um, Why can't you think of his name? Um, yes. Um, so, so the funniest thing was when Mark McCarricker and he are doing. So you know. Because I played a bullet boy. That's what Fontaine does in the second act. Right. So you know when everybody's when when everybody's asleep on the barricade wall. Yes. Um, and Javert and uh, Jean Valjean are having it out, and he unties him to let him go. Yes. You know, you know nothing of Javert. You know that everybody loves that scene. Do you know what? So can you can you do the Javert part? I mean, sorry. Can you do the um the uh, Jean Valjean part? Do you know I'm it? the Do worst you... musical theater nerd in the world. I can't, but someone raise your hand. Okay. Who knows it? Okay, Colden, you're on. Go. Um, is this the act oh. two part? Yes. Yes, and um, imagine, and imagine like the stakes are really, really high. And you I'm going to for this all your life. Take your revenge. All right, you should kill with a knife. Right? That's the... Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know nothing of Javert. And oh. I was... Born in the, na, na, na. I am from the gutter too. You know that whole part where they're they're singing the duet. I'm gonna mute that? myself. No, I guess I don't know that part. I thought it was the actor I, part. I, I've been humming. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't prepared, Rachel. You didn't tell me I needed to be off book for lame is crap. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay. That's okay. So imagine, if you will, that uh, Jean Valjean is saying, you know, listen, I. I, I stole some bread. It was because I needed it. And he's like trying to convince this man. And then imagine Javert coming back at him going, <laughs> and then we're, we're thinking, okay, he's going to get it together. He couldn't think of anything else. You can think of the words. But then, then Javert oh. says some things. And then we're thinking, okay, he's going to get it together. He's going to come back with his real lines. <laughs> <laughs> No! Oh my the god! The whole barricade is like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, that's my favorite lame is story. That that's, right there. That's imagine how many people like knew, even though nobody knew here word. knows. Um, yeah, because how many people know that know the, all of the lyrics to that show? Yeah, because by that time it was like it is what it is now. I mean, it was this mega thing that everyone knew and came back and saw multiple times. So that had to be a fun surprise for people. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> it's 
<laughs> what's happening? Oh, I love. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to a couple things because um, we're gonna I, we're gonna turn into pumpkins here in a second. So um, now you're now transitioning into you know you've done so much film and TV as well, um, but you have a new show coming on this fall uh, called Filthy Rich, which is amazing. Tell us about that. Filthy it's Rich for, for Fox, it's on, right? It's on Fox, and it's uh, it's a fun kind of soap opery kind of thing. Tate Taylor, who did The Help, do you remember that movie, The Help? Oh, of course, love, yeah. And uh, it stars Kim Cattrall. Oh, uh, yeah. And I play an alcoholic mother. Um, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. It's like, it's a fun kind of soap, you know? And it, it, it kind of, it all centers around, she's like, an, she's an evangelist. She has a talk show. She's like this billion, has this billion dollar industry as an evangelist. Oh, I'm on board. Um, this is yeah good. yeah yeah it's a lot of fun so that yeah that comes out it was supposed to come out earlier but they pushed it because um nobody has any shows coming out in the fall so they they figured i guess fox figured well we have an advantage here Heck we're gonna yeah. be one of the only two shows coming out in the fall so smart yeah because no one's filming that's amazing yeah so that's, that's awesome. coming out it's gonna be fun well, i'm excited for that um so a uh, couple other things i want to talk about and uh, we did have a, a question um, in the room before we get too far away from, um, uh, excuse me, from Victor Victoria. Um, there was uh, actually from Dylan. Uh, he said, are there fun, any fun stories of Raquel Welsh and or how different, I mean, because you could not have more th three different performers than those people. So how did that affect <laughs> the rest of the show too, like in, in the way that it affected your show as an example? Well, I left before, Julie left shortly after me, and I left right before, I, I, then Raquel Welch came in. Oh, okay, so you weren't there. No, I, I was there, but I, I did hear, I did hear what Blake, uh, something that Blake said, and that was not very nice, Blake. Oh. Um, apparently, they didn't get along. Yeah, I heard, uh, I've only heard also from, I think, uh, Les, Leslie Stevens about, I think it was Leslie Stevens about uh, that she was, um, not the nicest, uh, especially to, to the other women in the show, but she was not the nicest know. person during that run. No, when it, it would be so, which would be so sad going from Julie Andrews to even just Liza Minnelli, who had to be the sweet, I mean, you just had to go like, oh baby, like you're just the sweetest. And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And just that it's a, this icon and then Raquel Welch, like that would be such a bummer. Um, okay, so, um, I want to go into touching on, hard to just touch on, but you've really played like some iconic women and roles, the roles that you have developed as, you know, original things like City of Angels. Um, and then, you know, you've also had to step into the shoes of, of either like someone like Lucy, like Lucille Ball, uh, Lucille Ball, I mean, the, the, the weight you must have felt in in attacking that role, that human, which I'd love to hear about that process in playing her. Um, and then also then like, you know, Victor Victoria, you know, being based on a film, Grey Gardens being based on the documentary of real people. And, and um, you've had then even uh, more recently developing Ever After for Broadway and, and uh, playing, you know, the Baroness Radmilla de Ghent, you know, originally played by Angelica Houston. So you have done such a brilliant job in making these women your own and still yet giving audiences like, you know, the, the taste, the hints of expectation that's there. So how, do you, how, do, how have you navigated both of those types of situations and, and how, how do you kind of approach a Trial and error? Well, First of all, I, I try to do my homework. Uh, I, 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 I think there's two parts to the whole when you're trying to create a character. You have sort of the, the academic, the logical process, and then you have the intuitive process. And so, you know, I write down, you know, all that stuff. Where, you know, where are they from? What, what, were, what, was, what was their past like? You know, what makes them tick? All of that. And that's, that's not... Yeah, I don't, I don't think that you can really develop a character just from that. Then you have to take it another another way. Um, with with 
with Lucille Ball, I, sh I had to just shut out. I couldn't think about what I was, I couldn't think about the magnitude of it. Yeah. Um, I just had to do my work. And I watched, I, I had... It's seven o'clock. I had about... What had, is that? <laughs> My computer, I don't even know how to turn it off. Oh. <laughs> it <opens> up the time. <laughs> Lucy's coming through. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I had to, I, I watched everything. I read every book that I had on her. I, uh, in that month, I, I just, again, I mean, I just consumed Lucille Wait, Ball. Wait, did you say a month? Did you find out a month before you were going to play her? Yeah. That's cruel and unusual punishment. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was a wow. lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. I can't. And, uh, and, and, yeah. And so, and it was also like working, it was going to be 18 hour days. Yeah. And, and it, it was a really tough schedule. So, um, that like leaves you no time to do your, I went out there. I was going to say, it leaves you no time to even do homework when you're filming because you have to sleep. Like, you have no time to really. I was all, oh, it's seven o'clock. <laughs> hear about there a little bit? It's amazing. Um, what was I saying? Lucille Ball. Yeah, uh, yeah so I just, I, I tried to um, find everything on her. And it was a combination of really trying to find her essence, uh, you know, what, what her desires were. I found so much information about her. Uh, it was it was challenging uh, because a, a lot of decisions I knew so much about when I entered that that set I knew everything there was to know about Lucy Ball almost I mean I I had it all in here and and there was I saw so many choices being made by the creative team that I felt like oh she wouldn't have liked that right. um, but I had no it was it was a humbling experience on many. Right in many levels playing um, someone that would have been in charge of everything but in charge of nothing oh, yeah. she, and she was such a perfectionist so right. in sort of going into her psyche and channeling her right. i became a perfectionist sure and it uh, i was like oh i can't do anything about it so i'd, I'd campaign to like hey you know this should be like this you know and a lot of times you're like uh oh, we can't do anything about it now it's already done you know and i was like okay um, and there was a, I always tell this story because I think it's absurd, is we had a, a hair and makeup guy from Australia who had done Braveheart, I think, at the time. And he, I had to film some scenes of the bread scene of a couple of yes. scenes of Lucille Balls that wanted to uh, recreate. Yeah, from the Lucille and yeah, right. So I... It was important that I look exactly like her in the scene, correct? I mean, that makes sense, right? So the, the makeup artist says to me, says about a week or so before we shoot, he says, so I don't think we're going to be able to have the ponytail for that. Because everything else we had shot, she had, had long hair or she had, the, she had her hair the way pre Lucy yeah. ball. Uh, yeah. I love Lucy. Look. I love Lucy, yeah. Said, yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do the whole the whole ponytail thing. I'm like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? You know, we're not gonna be able to do the ponytail thing. That's, that's, that's what she looked like, people. It's, it's iconic. It's, right. it's- I would've been like, it's like Beto! Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? You know, can you imagine I'm trying to like, learn all my lines. There's, I have like a million scenes a day trying to take on these like, sorry, we can't, we can't just make you look like her at all. <laughs> you know, we're gonna make you look like somebody else. Um, so, um, I said, well, that's just unacceptable. I, I said, he said, like, well, I put it in a ponytail. He said, it's just a little nub. It doesn't look good at all. I was like, well, isn't this, isn't this the length of her hair at the time? Isn't this the way her hair was naturally? And, and he's like, yeah, well, well, that she had, there must've been some way that she put it up. I was like, I know what it is. It's one of those, those banana clip things where they go like this. That's no. what it is. I go to the store, get one of those banana clips and I bet it will look just like it. So come the day of the scene, and I'm not even feeling well this day, I remember. Um, he's, I said, we're about to get into the hair and makeup. And he says, 
I said, so did you get the banana clip? He's like, no. I was like, well, I'm not doing a scene until you get the banana clip. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do Lucy with long hair in a scene that she is remembered for, that people have watched a hundred times over. <laughs> so no this way. is what you're, can you imagine this is what I'm dealing with? I'm, I'm trying to stay focused and play this iconic woman and, and do her justice. And I'm having to fight the makeup and hair person to make you look like they can't her. figure it out. And I even gave them the answer. So it was really frustrating. <laughs> wow. Eventually they got the clip and he did it and it looked exactly like it. Yeah. I mean, I, that's wild that like, A, they wouldn't have someone who specialized. I mean, like there has to be a few people in Hollywood that specialize in being able to make people, A, look like other people, but also like, Lucy, I mean, like, she's someone that has been done a few times, so unbelievable. But I'm glad you fought for that, because I would, as a, as a avid Lucy fan and knowing every episode, I would have been pissed off. <laughs> Tell me about it, and who would have gotten the flack for it? Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you fought for that. Um, okay, so, because we're running out of time, um, you are a, one of, one of the people I'm saying, you know, we have our first responders right now, which is so different than people who are, you know, in the medical field. It's also like our grocery store workers, everyone that we've been, Amazon delivery people and all that. And I've also been giving shout outs to people like Christy, who's here, who's doing this all by herself and, and sheltering in place by herself. And then also people like yourself who are a parent, but a parent of one child. You don't, you can't even say like, we can't, we have three and it's tough, but we can go like, go talk to your brother. You know what I mean? Or whatever it is. But it's like, you have one kid, you are their teacher, you're their parent, you're their best friend, you're their playmate. And I know Olivia is one of the best kids I've ever met. And like, so amazing. And you guys are like best friends anyway, but thank you know, Hey, shout out to you for, for being awesome. Besides being mom and teacher and best friend and all that. The kids also deserve some credit. Because oh, like 100%. I said, it's as if these kids suddenly, you know, a nine-year-old suddenly has an office job, a nine to five office job and has to be proficient on the computer overnight. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't even good at that at 19 when I had an office job, much yeah. less a nine-year-old. Exactly, no, 100% agree. Um, what are you doing to stay artistic during quarantine? Uh, well, as uh, I mentioned before, I did just, uh, I wrote a, a pilot and I still have to, to do rewrites and make it better. So I got to, I, we won't talk about it because I, it, it's still in its process, but you guys, I got to hear, it's definitely one that I hope gets bought and picked up because it's really, really cool. Um, and hopefully we'll get to hear more about that at some point. Um, but I want to um, uh, tell everyone, you guys, huge, amazing opportunity. Rachel York is now going to be taking on students. She's going oh. to take on private students, y'all, and no one to help you develop your audition book better than this funny woman who sings her face off and knows how to interpret a song uh, from both a vocal and an acting standpoint. Um, so I'm gonna give her a shout. She's actually gonna come on and teach a class, uh, a master class on here as well. But if you wanna book her privately, rachelyorkcoaching at gmail.com, email her. You got Rachel York's email, racheljorkcoaching at gmail.com. Um, and uh, also her Instagram handles are in the chat feed or all of her social handles are in the chat feed. You should absolutely follow her because um, you will see her with Julie Andrews and you're just going to see how much cooler her life is than yours. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, so real quick, what's next for you? Do you have anything... Um, yeah, I know every, life is halted, so I wouldn't imagine you have anything like- I'm making dinner with my husband. Yay! Which we gotta <laughs> let you get to. Does anyone, before we let Rachel uh, go, is there anyone that has any, well, first of all, we have five of our Adams family uh, here. Five, we have uh, uh, Nick and Dylan, and we got Robert and Natalie and uh, Anthony. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, Adams family uh, here, which is amazing, a little. Isn't that a fun show, guys? That was just so much fun. I really I have to say, like that was unbelievable. Like that show, because it was 
everything I feel like the original, not to say, you know, but the original should have been like, it was funny. It was sexy. It was, it knew what it was. And y'all like defined the roles in your own way and still gave the essence of what those people needed to be. It was so much fun and such a challenge to work on, but it was so yeah, much fun. People rocked it, rocked it. Yeah, you guys killed it. Um, so yeah, um, is there anyone that has a question for the incredible Richie York? Yes, Mr. Colden, I had a feeling. Oh wait, let me, un oh yeah, go ahead, you're good. First of all, Miss York, I apologize for not knowing my Les Miserables lyrics. I feel so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many confrontations, I don't know which one to start. But anyway, my question is, I'm currently reading Cy Coleman's um, biography, and in the book it discusses about how strict he was with his singers about how he wanted his music to be performed. Um, with Lilius White, he had a good relationship with, but with Madeline Kahn, he really didn't. What was your relationship in working with the music of City of Angels and working with Cy Coleman? Uh, I, had a, uh, I, I didn't have that experience with him. Uh, he was amazing. He was generous, kind, creative. Um, he knew voices. He knew what what um, what key everybody should be singing in, just by listening to their speaking voice. Um, he he was really really kind and sweet to me and gentle, and I really appreciate that at that time because it was you know my first Broadway show. Um, was he a collaborator? I I probably, you know, if I had any kind of uh, jazz lick or anything I wanted to do, I'm I'm sure I, you know, brushed it past him first before I tried it. But um, he was pretty, you know, generous in that way, as I recall. That's amazing to hear. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Um, so, any uh, other last questions? Raise your hand if you have anything. We've covered a lot of ground. Oh, I see you, Natalie Iskovich. I just want to say it was so nice to hear you talk about like Julie and kind of that relationship. I, um, I met her because my dad was the producer on Princess Diaries and she was lovely. But also I just want to say when I worked with you, I felt similarly. You're so lovely and giving and generous. And I just remember working with you and I was really like, it was six years ago almost. And um, it was that. really, uh, it was just really lovely. And so all those things that you were saying about those women, I just wanted to let you know, like you were all those things for, I think a lot of us in the cast, but just yeah. when you talk and sitting here with you now, I was just remembering how wonderful and vivacious and kind you were. So thank and you very it, much. I it, very much enjoyed working with all of you. It's a beautiful thing that you said, Natalie, and, and so true. And actually something I forgot to say in my introduction, usually when I have someone onto my corner, the, this little, like show I do on Wednesdays it's always someone who has impacted me greatly as an artist and it's it was such a bizarre full circle moment for me going from obsessing over her performances you know in, in like as Norma in literally like we would rewind your after your your big number on the bar and you had that crossover to the booth and you had this laugh that was <laughs> this like giggle that you did that was so brilliant. Gretchen, my sister Gretchen's like, yes. That we was going to be my question. Uh. Oh. <laughs> we would obsess over it, rewind it, rewind it, rewind it, because it was so genius and so funny. TJ and I, like, I can't even tell you how many times we rewind. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And it was just, but to go from that and then to go, I'm going to get to direct Rachel York in a show. What? And then you come in and you were exactly as Natalie said, every bit is gracious and collaborative and and you had no you've worked with the greats and to be you know in even though we were friends but you were not ever like yeah I don't think I'm gonna you're like anything I was like hey could you blah 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 you were always like yeah great no problem and it was such a great collaboration and you had ideas I had ideas and it was just this uh, you created this really incredible Morticia Adams that should have 100% been uh on the Broadway that way. It was really beautiful. You know, I have something to, to say after that. Um, Blake Edwards, in his, a really great learning experience I had in Victor Victoria was, we, he never froze the show. Even, you know, most shows freeze before they open. We ne he never, he was always tinkering with it. 
And there were times when he would write a whole new scene and we would have to do it that night. Wow. And we kind of got used to it after a while. Um, but a couple of times we would get the scene and we'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so funny. Oh, I know exactly how to do this, right? And we'd do it and we'd be like, we had this energy and we're like, we're gonna kill this. And it was crickets, <laughs> crickets, crickets. And then there were other times when he gave us a script and you know, mind you, we, we were getting this all the time. So sometimes we were like, oh, seriously? <laughs> and we would, get a, we would get a new scene and be like, oh my God, this is so stupid. Oh, do we have to do this? And we'd be like, just, just try it. Just try it once. I just want to see. I just, I just want to see. Just try it once. And we're like, oh, begrudgingly doing it. We do it. It stops the show. So it just goes to show you, even though you might think you know what's going to work, sometimes you just have to try it. And you got to trust. Amen. That's why I, was, I would always give. So that's why. Oh, what's no, that? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, what, what did you say? Oh, I was saying I would always give Bronson so much shit for that because I was like, he, he would have, because he's such a brilliant comedian and he would like, you know, have a million and one ideas and but he would have to try his million and one ideas before he would end up going, yeah, I think your idea was probably right. <laughs> and he would end up landing back on my, on my idea. And then he finally- Well, you never know. You never know. And then some of his ideas were, I was like, oh, way better, do that, blah, blah, blah. And that was like a great, but it was a, it was a learning process. And then by the time we opened, I was like, aren't you glad you finally tried? Cause I would give him, I would text him, you know, so much. Cause he was just, we, we have this great relationship. He's coming on, uh, on this as well. And, um, I, I love him. He makes me laugh. Yeah. We've That's kept in contact. We've gone out to lunch many times since and he's just so much fun and um but anyway I, I would i would text him so much crap during the show like it was one night he was we were like in opening weekend i was like welcome to the adams family because he like finally was like okay i'm like my feet are on the ground like i know what i'm doing and it was uh yeah it was that whole process was very rewarding and i learned so much as a as an artist. So that is what, how you have impacted my life. And I'm so thrilled to have you on here. Is there any um, last minute, because we got to let this woman eat dinner with her family. Is there any last minute questions real quick before we go? No? All right, you guys. A huge round of applause for this incredible woman. Amazing. Rachel York, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on and sharing your time with us. And, and uh, we love you so much. And uh, cannot I'm wait. going down memory lane. It is indeed, and I cannot wait to uh, get out to New York again and be in that community and see you all, and we'll go out to a good vegan dinner somewhere. <laughs> all right. Mwah. Love to everyone out there. See you all later.